I've been watching Don't Look Up on Netflix, and as an astronomy and science bod, you'd be expecting me to say, Well, that's a right pile of shit. No comet's going to cause any problems on that scale, is it, Hughie? <laughs> I think you'll find one of the equations on the chalkboard used a gamma symbol when it clearly should have been an infinity. I'll let the internet know immediately. Or something equally dull and pedantic. Well, I'm not. In fact, it's all right. Now, I can't comment on it as a film review. Well, I could, but you'd probably want me to stick to what I'm good at and talk about astronomy and science. And even there, there's nothing to bother me about this film. As a professional astronomer, I'm not quite as happy clappy as Ralph is. It wasn't like seeing Jodie Foster looking for aliens in the film Contact by adjusting the reverb settings on a sound effects processor, or how people move in moon bases like the gravity isn't one sixth of that on Earth, or how ships move in space like they're fighter jets in air in every goddamn space film. So in this show, we're going to be discussing Don't Look Up, but without any spoilers. We're going to be considering the reality of comets, collisions, extinction events, and how we might avoid these disasters. And of course, it wouldn't be a discussion of Don't Look Up without including AILFs. But for that one, you're probably going to have to watch the movie. So if you haven't watched the movie or have no intention of watching it, the basic premise is that astronomers find a comet that's heading towards Earth, no one takes them seriously, hilarity ensues and the family goes on Christmas vacation, leaving them to defend the house from Joe Pesci and Daniel Stern. So if there are any spoilers in this video, there's a good chance he's only spoiling Home Alone. Anyways, first up is how the astronomy PhD candidate Kate Dibiaski finds the comet, and that's pretty realistic. Now, in fact, that's not fair, it's very realistic. Now, in reality, there's a good chance an amateur could have even found the comet, as very few professional astronomers actually watch the sky these days, with most relying on data and sets of numbers and figures generated by astronomical instruments, rather than seeing the objects themselves, or relying on sky surveys to be able to pick out uh, anomalies uh, that are in the sky. Now, amateur astronomers, on the other hand, spend an ungodly amount of time outside in ungodly temperatures just looking up at the skies and scanning them with telescopes of all shapes and sizes. And that's pretty much one reason why UFOs aren't anything out of the ordinary, because millions of amateur astronomers are spending so much time actually watching the skies every moment of the day and night, everywhere on the globe, and would love to see something unusual. They also know what aircraft, satellites, and the planets Venus and Jupiter look like, which is what most UFOs turn out to be, but I digress. One of the most prodigious comet discoverers isn't a professional astronomer at all. Terry Lovejoy is an amateur sky watcher from Australia and has six comets named after him, which brings us to another point about the movie. Yes, the PhD candidate would get the comet named after her for finding it, if her supervisor, in this case Leonardo DiCaprio, didn't claim all the credit for it himself, which was quite common in the past. So Jennifer Lawrence's character sees an object in the sky that's in a different position in different images, so it's clearly moving with respect to the background star field. And this is exactly how comet and asteroid hunters find them today. Most amateur astrophotographers will have taken images of faint dwarf planets or asteroids or comets moving across the sky in exactly the same way, with equipment that you can buy yourself. In fact, in 1929, a 23-year-old man from Illinois was given the very laborious task of using a telescope in Arizona to photograph the night sky and then pour over the photographic plates looking for tiny specks of light, little dots that were seemingly moving from night to night to night. And on the 18th of February 1930, Clyde Tombaugh found what his benefactor was looking for, a hypothesised planet far in the depths of the solar system. Later that year, this planet was given the name Pluto after the Greek god of the underworld. In 2005, we demoted Pluto to a dwarf planet because it's too small to care about. Move on, people. But it's not all sweetness and light here at Awesome Astronomy, and I'm going to take a moment to diverge from Ralph's super positivity about this film. 
because there are a couple of things that they have done which is not really accurate to how professional astronomy is performed in the modern era. Now, I know it's a film, they're allowed to take artistic license, but I think it is worth taking the time just to point out the differences between sort of the film astronomy and the modern era professional astronomy. So one of the first things I want to talk about is one of the opening scenes, and this isn't a spoiler, you just see the astronomer student, she sat at a desk right next to the telescope, so on a platform next to the telescope. And in reality, this isn't how things are done. First of all, that telescope is 13,000 feet or 4,000 metres up on the summit of Mauna Kea. It is freezing. And that telescope, when the dome is opened, it's open to the elements. It would be far too cold for anyone to work right next to the telescope. Also, you can't risk having any vibrations from your footfall affecting the telescope, especially if you're doing a long exposure. And also just your body heat that can create eddies and currents in the air. And of course, then that will disturb your image. So no one is ever in the room with the telescope while you're actually taking data, actually observing. Instead, what we do is we have what's called a warm room or an observation room. And this is a room that's attached to the telescope. There might be a secondary room kind of in between the telescope dome and this warm room to stop too much heat transfer. And this is where we have all of our computers. We also have all of the screens as feeding us back information about the telescope. So where is it pointing? Uh, what are the temperatures like? What's the wind conditions like? All sorts of things like that. What is the humidity in the air? Because that's another important factor to consider. But all of that happens in this warm room and it's completely separate from the telescope. And of course, this warm room is where we actually control the telescope. So it depends on the telescope, but sometimes the astronomer who's actually taking the observations can control the telescope. That's always a little bit of a trial by fire because you might have someone for a couple of days showing you how the telescope works and then you're sort of on your own. Or alternatively, what tends to happen with the large telescopes is that you have a dedicated telescope operator and this person will be moving the telescope, slewing it to where you want to be. And then you're sort of more in charge of how long the exposures are and things like that. Now, this might seem a little bit strange, like why isn't the astronomer controlling the telescope? But you have to remember that these telescopes cost millions of pounds to make. And you really don't want to put that into the hands of someone who hasn't got the foggiest clue how to drive it. It would be a bit like putting someone in charge of an aeroplane and saying, right, off you go, go and fly it then, when all they've done is sort of driven a car before. Something else which happens at the start of the film, which isn't really like reality, is you see the astronomers doing a bunch of really complicated orbital dynamics equations and calculations by hand. And when you're 4,000 metres up at the top of Mauna Kea and you're sleep deprived because you've had to switch your sleeping pattern from being awake in the day to being awake at night and sort of sleeping through the day, you absolutely cannot trust your brain to do anything, not even sort of two plus two. Everything is absolutely run through a computer and you would be doing things using some quick look tools that maybe you've developed on the flight on the way over or maybe in the week preceding to your observing time or you'd be using software that was sort of established in the 1970s and 80s and it worked then, so it works now. Another kind of luxury that seems to be in this film, I don't know where these astronomers are getting all of this money from, but that giant touch screen that she has with all of that fancy new software, that definitely doesn't exist in these observatories. It's far beyond the budget of what would be allowed, because after all, you know, astronomers, they're using taxpayers' money, right? And something like that really is a luxury. So no, unfortunately, astronomy is maybe not as glamorous as everyone thinks. We're going to be using software, as I said before, from the 70s or 80s, if it existed then, or it'll be something that we've put together ourselves. But yeah, definitely not those massive touchscreens. Don't get me wrong, they would be amazing. But yeah, I think um, it's a bit too glamorous for the realities of astronomy. And something else that happened right at the start of the film that, oh, it made the professional astronomer inside me kind of like curl up a little bit and got all my sphincters winking, was when they were slewing the telescope while they were opening the dome. Now, in my experience, you never have the telescope moving while you're opening up that dome, because if there's any debris or any water that's kind of collected on that dome, you don't want the risk of anything, even the minuscule amount, falling onto your multi-million dollar mirror because at the wavelengths that sort of Subaru operates, 
then any even tiny imperfections can cause real big problems. This isn't the case of radio telescopes, they're fine out in the open because the wavelengths of light that they're looking at are so much longer than the size of any imperfections, so it doesn't really matter to them. But yeah, in my experience, you kind of keep the cover over the mirror, you open up your shutters, and then when that's done, then you'll kind of open up your mirror, and then the reverse is true when you're shutting down for the night, you cover up that mirror, and then you close the shutters again. Of course, you know, covers on mirrors may be not practical for every single telescope, but that's what my experience is. And uh, it did make me kind of go, ah, when it was happening. So could a comet be on a trajectory to hit Earth? Well, yes, absolutely. We covered the potential for asteroids to wipe us out in this video, and comets could also wipe us out in exactly the same way. In fact, we don't see small comets because they're made of mostly ice, so small ones would melt up in the glare of the sun as they moved into the inner solar system. The tail is mostly that, it's a stream of gas and dust as the sun vaporises its outer layers. So any comet that gets closer to us or the sun than Mars is going to be big, or it would have just evaporated or sublimated, as astronomers say. And there are millions of comets that can sit quite happily in the outer regions of the solar system for millions of years. So comets come from two main places. One of them is called the Kuiper Belt, and it's a ring of icy debris beyond the orbit of Neptune, where we find some of the dwarf planets like Pluto and Eris. The other place that they come from is much further out. This really kind of the last point of the solar system, the sun's last gravitational influence in space. And it's this giant spherical shell of debris left over from its formation, icy debris. And we call that the Oort cloud. And although the Oort cloud is theoretical, we've never actually seen it. We've never been able to image any of it. It is our best explanation for where these very long period comets come from. Ones that take thousands, tens of thousands of years to complete an orbit around the sun. And it is the Oort cloud where the comet in Don't Look Up actually originates from. Now space is really big, you can see just how big in this video of ours. So the chances of two objects hitting one another are really small. But the history of the solar system is very long and over time unlikely events become certainties. And Jupiter's immense gravity regularly pulls comets in from the outer solar system and often causes them to break up into smaller fragments before hitting the giant planet's atmosphere or its moons. But even though smaller fragments are many kilometres across and would really ruin your day if they're on a collision course with Earth. So coming back to Earth every year we get dozens of meteor showers that are actually caused by debris, that's bits of ice and dust left in the wake of comets that come into the inner solar system. Those fragments of comets burn up in the Earth's atmosphere as we pass through them, but that of course means that if the timing of that comet pass had been different, it could have hit us. And the comets that cause the annual meteor showers are all many kilometres across, and at that size, again, if they hit, they're going to really ruin your day, unless you like living in a post-apocalyptic wasteland with no technology, assuming that you're one of the very few survivors. So, as happened in Don't Look Up, would we only get six months notice of an inbound comet? And again, yeah, comets are easier to spot than asteroids because comets get that bright tail as they get closer. Now, some asteroids we don't even see until they've already zipped by and we can say, that one came closer than the moon. And I don't want to worry you, but something like that happens at least every year. But they're mostly much smaller objects, probably only big enough to destroy your town or city. But comets get noticed as soon as they develop into a tail at the very latest, which is about six months to a year out from close approach. We get a few comet visitors each year and they're rarely close enough to be naked eye visible. Most need binoculars or a telescope to see them, but every couple of decades we get a really bright one that's reflecting light off a giant icy tail. Amateur astronomers are always happy to see a comet in the sky as bright as the one in the movie. Those bastards in the southern hemisphere always get the best views of comets and we northern hemisphere dwellers usually get the little dregs of a streak of light on the horizon on a dreary wet December dawn. And again we say a big well done to the way that Don't Look Up handles the calculation of the orbital dynamics of the comet. 
because any astronomer would probably be able to pull from somewhere in the deep dark depths of their brain their orbital mechanical lessons that they had during undergrad or maybe in their master's degree and they would be able to get a rough estimate or perhaps they would use a tool that someone else developed in order to get a rough estimate of the orbit of the comet again it wouldn't be done on a whiteboard it would be done with a computer because you know at those heights you've got no oxygen in your brain so you can't trust the maths on the board but then of course these details would then be submitted to the minor planet center the minor planet center in massachusetts would then take all of the information that the astronomers can send them so all of the images and then all of the information about the images so how long the exposures were where they were pointing in the sky and so on and they would run through the calculations and extract as much information from possible and make the orbital path as accurate as possible. Observations then would continue for several more days because, of course, the longer you observe an object, the more information and the more accurate you can make all of your calculations. The initial calculations would show, yeah, it's heading towards Earth, give or take a few thousand kilometres, or yeah, I mean, it is going to get pretty close to Earth. It might hit, give or take a few days. But then, of course, as observations of the object continue, then we get more information, we can refine the numbers. And then if we did discover a comet that was almost definitely going to be hitting Earth, that's when the information would be passed on to the government. And then, unfortunately, just like in Don't Look Up, the discoverers would just become part of the media. Now, word spreads really quickly in astronomy circles, as they do in any subgroup, and astronomers love mathematical puzzles. So you're going to get a lot of unofficial calculations, a lot of press events at NASA, the Royal Astronomical Society, and pretty much everywhere else. And the media is going to be flooded with professional images from the Hubble Space Telescope to Barry in a car park with an off-the-shelf amateur telescope. Believe me, this would not be ignored until it was visible in the sky to everyone. You're going to see it getting close night after night after night with a thousand images every day as people track it from the moment of discovery until you can see it with your own eyes. But don't look up to satire. And you couldn't satirise the government, greedy billionaires and the media and celebrity culture as well if you kept everything accurate, could you? But as we can see from this US National Research Council presentation on defending planet Earth from near-Earth objects, anything hitting our planet that's over 140 metres in diameter is going to wipe out a city or create a localised tsunami if it hits water. Anything over 300 metres is going to cause damage to a whole continent. Over a kilometre across is going to be a global catastrophe with millions or billions of deaths and most known comets are between 1 and 10 kilometers in size. Then a comet the size of the one in Don't Look Up, some of which we know about in real life, though not inbound thankfully, would cause a global extinction. Of course, comets are... they burn up a lot more than asteroids, so you would expect that a lot more would burn up in the atmosphere, but because they're much bigger generally than asteroids, you're still expecting a lot to survive to get down to the surface and punch a big hole that's going to cause problems for us. So can we do anything about it once we know? Well, probably not. This video shows you how NASA are currently testing a method to deflect an asteroid, something that may also work with comets too, but six months is a bit too soon to do anything. If we found out with a year to go, we might be able to build and send enough rockets to slam into the asteroid or comet, or a robotic mission to detonate bombs just above the surface to nudge it off course, the nuclear option being particularly risky because you don't really want those sitting on a rocket that could blow up in the atmosphere before it gets into space. So while it takes years to get new rockets built, in a shit or bust scenario that portends the end of the world, I think the governments of the world would throw everything at this, massively speeding things up. We also have the world's richest people building rockets these days, and they'd no doubt also have ideas to speed things up or provide additional options too. Just like the billionaire played by the phenomenal Mark Rylance in Don't Look Up. However, we really can't smash a comet to smithereens and then bring the pieces back to Earth to mine them for rare Earth minerals. There are just too many risks and variables to this idea. Now you could calculate which side of the Earth would be facing the comet at the point of impact. And because of that, you can believe that every government and citizen on that hemisphere 
is going to be very f***ing nervous with pieces of comet raining down on it. But there's no way to break up a comet or asteroid and ensure that it falls to Earth, let alone ensure that it falls somewhere it can be recovered. How do you ensure it lands on land in the desert or in the ocean to be retrieved? Can you even retrieve massive rocks from the bottom of the ocean? But quite simply, it's a really poor plan even if you are more concerned about getting valuable minerals from a comet than making sure it doesn't hit us because if you could reliably break it up into small enough pieces to hit Earth without causing devastation, lots of it will burn up or vaporise in the atmosphere. So you've lost your investment. Have the fragments be big enough to survive to hit land and they're going to be like thermonuclear devices raining down on you and we're back to having your day ruined again. So whether you get hit by a single massive comet or lots of pieces of a comet, this lets me just dust off my favourite Hobson's Choice analogy about whether we want to be hit in the face with a rifle bullet or a shotgun blast. Uh, neither please. But it was nice to see the comet drones in the film struggling to latch onto the comet because back in 2014 a European Space Agency mission called Rosetta landed a probe on the surface of a comet catchily named Churyumov-Gerasimenko and you guessed it after the name of the people who found it and just like in the film the probe's harpoons didn't secure it well enough and it bounced and tumbled a bit before coming to a stop. However, the good news is, is that we have a lot of rockets. We also have a lot of experience landing probes on comets. And we also have a lot of things that go bang. Another great thing that's happening is the DART mission. So the double asteroid redirect test, which NASA is running at the minute. It is due to arrive at an asteroid in September 2022. And that is our first full scale planetary defence test, where we are essentially going to punch an asteroid to see if we can change its orbit. And this is exactly the sort of thing that, given enough notice, so, you know, six months or so, we could put together a mission and send it up and kind of nudge the incoming comet out of the way. And I guess one question is, would we have enough notice? Would we get six months notice? Well, if it's big enough to be an extinction event, almost definitely. But hey, don't worry about comets. There's a 99% greater chance we'll get wiped out by an asteroid. And you can find out here how real the risk is and how NASA are looking to defend us against asteroid or comet strikes. And as for AILFs, Move over, Leonardo DiCaprio. Oh my.